Welcome to my studio. I am so glad to have you here. So are you an artist and have wondered how to go about pricing your artwork? And are you maybe new to selling your work, need some help navigating that uh, pricing topic? So if so, I am here to help. And so let's get started. In today's video, I'll be going over four methods to price your artwork and answering all your questions. So if you're new to my channel, welcome. And I hope that you'll subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you'll never uh, miss a new video. And if you're returning, uh, welcome back, and I'm really glad to have you here. So I am a professional artist. I'm a full-time artist, and I sell my work through art galleries for the past 19 years. So let me just get a little painting here. I'll show you. So here's an example of my work. I do this really heavily textured uh, impasto. This is a little monarch painting that I did. And uh, I also do watercolors, but I'm mostly known for this style of work. But let's get going. Let's start with a list of the uh, four ways to price your work. So the first, uh, the first method or the first model, and also if you're on the chat, I appreciate, I'm going to check the chat here and just see if, uh, if anybody is here. I want to welcome that you guys are here. Oh, Madonna. Hey, Madonna. Good to see you. How are you doing over there in Missouri? I'm in Iowa, as you know. So it's, uh, it's good to see you. It's kind of cold and windy here today. Um, okay, so this first model, or the first one, is called uh, the similar artist model. Okay, and so, uh, and what we'll do today is we'll go through all of these different, and I've got some uh, do's and don'ts. Uh, that we'll go through, but uh, go through these different models. I'll talk about um, what has worked for me. We can talk about the pros and the cons of the different methods, uh, that type of thing. And uh, oh, hey, Alex, good to see you. I'm always live when you're at school. <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, and hey, Diana, good to see you. So this first um, artist model, uh, this uh, similar artist model, let me grab a piece of paper. And let's talk about that a little bit. So what, well, actually, I can do it right on here. Um, what you want to do is you want to find a local artist. And what you're going to be doing is comparing your, uh, your um, size of your work and the types of materials and that type of thing, comparing that to, um, to, to what they are doing. So what you're, what you're going to be doing is looking at a local artist and uh, try and find someone that is doing the same medium as you. So whether that's watercolor or a colored pencil, oil, acrylic, whatever, framed, unframed, try and find something that's similar. Try and find the same subject matter, if possible. And um, when we say subject matter, it could be like, is it like abstract, realism, that type of thing, real. Ism, <laughs> realism, uh, try and find that type of thing. Then what you want to do is you want to go in and uh, the key with this is don't compare uh, if you have the same skill set as they do. So um, that's the one thing about art that is really, really important is that it is not based on skill level. Sales are not based on skill level. Um, really. Uh, sales are based on um, on your name recognition. So the key here, when you look for a similar artist, what you'll want to look at is to look and see, um, are they of the same kind of um, level as I am? So if you're a beginner at this, so let's just make an example here. So let's say that you've got uh, Sally, and then you've got Wayne, and you're out looking and you're comparing and you're trying to decide what to charge for your own work. Hey, Erica, good to see you. And thank you for joining. So let's say that you've got uh, Sally and Wayne and you're doing the similar artist model. Uh, let's say that Sally does watercolor. And I'm actually going to switch to a smaller pen here. Let's grab this one. Um, let's say that she does the same sizes as you. Let's say that uh, you do maybe 16 by 20s and 8 by 10s. And let's say that she's a local artist, uh, local to you. 
and let's say that she's at the same level of fame. Now, your fame level could be that um, your parents know you and your grandparents know you and your, or your kids know you. That, that could be one level of fame. The other level of fame could be you're an Andy Warhol. So all along that continuum, um, the key to remember is that literally every famous artist started out with zero sales. Leonardo da Vinci, um, Andy Warhol, um, you know, you name anybody, Monet. Everybody had to make their first sale. Everybody had zero at the beginning. Everybody starts from that same point. So if you think of it like, uh, like a singer, um, the uh, singers, it's not always who is uh, the best singer who um, ends up getting the record deal or ends up with, uh, with that. A lot of it has to do with who has perseverance, who um, gets their name out, who does marketing, and then also who just has the, you know, has the willingness to try and, and make those sales. And hey, Artsy, good to see you. And, um, and I'm glad that you guys are all here. So, uh, so if we compare, if we're doing the um, similar artist method, similar, if I can spell today. If we did a similar artist method and we're comparing, say, Sally and Wayne. Now let's say that Wayne does um, oil and um, he does large art and he lives in a different country. And let's say that um, he's famous across two continents. Um, when you look and you say, um, I'm going to compare my work against an artist and you had these two to choose from, definitely, let's say that you did watercolor. Let's say maybe you did acrylics or watercolor, color pencil or something. But if you look at that, the big thing that to look at would be um, how, how famous or how, um, how much uh, notoriety does that person have. That would be the key. You also want to compare the sizes. So. If, uh, if you're making, say, small art, you would want to go with Sally. Now, let's say that you're an artist and you are um, known nationally or internationally. Um, then you'd want to be comparing your prices against Wayne. And it's all these things in between. But what you do is you'll go in. The, the way to do this, then, is you want to look at, uh, don't look so much at skill level, but look instead at sales. And um, oh, and hey, Chrissy. And um, good to see you, Chrissy, and thank you for joining. So, uh, so what you want to do is you want to take a look at um, at this level of you know how how famous or not famous is that individual compared against you, and then go in and look at their prices. So things to look at is is the work framed or unframed, and then try and get prices for that. Try and match up. Look on the gallery wall, or if you're looking at Etsy, or you're looking at something like that, look and see if you're working, say, that you're doing a lot of things in 11 by 14. Try and find their sizes that are 11 by 14, and try and look and compare something that's going to be a similar size, similar subject matter, and then whether it's uh, framed or unframed. Um, that's the way you want to kind of try and compare those. And uh, oh, hey, Joe, good to see you. So the next, uh, so that's the first, the first model to look at would be the similar artist model. So again, you're going to try and pick someone that's local to you, pick a similar uh, medium um, that if they're working in a similar medium, because oftentimes works on paper are priced less expensively than uh, works on canvas. Or if you're doing um, giclés or prints, that type of thing, try and find somebody that's doing something similar, and then um, look at the sizes. But don't spend so much time looking at the skill level. It's really uh, the name recognition. So the second method um, of pricing, grab the bigger pen here, is the time and materials model. Now I know if any of you are familiar with Erica Lancaster, she's got a wonderful channel. Uh, she will talk about the time and materials method. Um, she does that sometimes here when she's doing M-E-T-H-O-D-S, when she's doing uh, commissions, that type of thing. So what you do with that for the time and materials method is you're going to have an hourly rate that you give yourself, and we'll go through that here in a minute, an hourly rate, and then you're going to have your art materials cost, 
and then you're going to add uh, shipping and then you're going to have framing and then you can choose if you're going to do um, if for example you're going to be adding um, any other things like studio space uh, easels, wipes, canvases, brushes, um, transportation, anything else like that, um, then what you would do is you would, um, you would include those things if you want to include that into your time and materials. So, and actually, let's um, get a couple of do's and don'ts here with that too. So for pricing, do's and don'ts, um, you want to keep your price list handy at all times. <laughs> at all times, not in the uh, not while you're sleeping, obviously, <laughs> but um, so keep your price list. I keep mine on the computer, um, so that way if, uh, and I also have printouts, so if I get a visitor to my studio who is wondering about prices, maybe wants to try a commission, that kind of thing, I have that price list handy. Um, mine looks like this. I have uh, price lists like this. I'll show you mine, I'll go through that in a little bit uh, too. But you want to keep that price list handy. Um, and then the other thing that you'd want to do would be to um, keep your prices consistent. So, for example, um, in one place, you don't want to have, for example, in one location, let's say that you um, got into an exhibit um, at the local, um, local uh, restaurant and you hung up your paintings and you said that maybe a, an eight by 10 is gonna be $1,000 and then you have a, a sale um, in your studio and that same eight by 10 might only be $200. What that's gonna do is that's gonna create price confusion and so you wanna really keep your prices consistent and then um, you wanna factor in you wanna factor in your uh, gallery profit Or if you're selling with um, selling through a co-op, uh, if you have any kind of um, even something like Etsy or PayPal, they're going to have um, when you do something like that, they take a few percent for PayPal. Um, if you're going to have any kind of charges that are associated with um, working with um, a co-op or any kind of a thing like that, um, then you want to uh, profit uh, on a gallery tends to be usually around 50%. So know that when you, if you have a painting that is $500, um, when it sells, you'll get a check for $250 um, if they take 50% profit. So you want to factor that in to your pricing model. All right. Okay, so let's check the chat here. Shipping is very, very important. Absolutely. And uh, I'll end up, okay, yeah, Chrissy, we'll check, uh, catch you later and good luck with your visitors and um, hey artsy and it's good to see you and if I've missed anybody I um, apologize if I've missed anybody so uh, you want to factor in your gallery profit so the other thing to think about is um, let's see here oh uh, uh, the thing too about consistent everywhere you sell All right, so you want to fact do, um, so these are do, 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 and then a don't would be um, don't raise and lower your prices through the years. This is super, super important. You don't want to raise and lower your prices during the years. You want to go slow and steady, increase only. And I'll say if there's any, the most important thing about today's topic would be probably this. Um, the, the trick is to start low, and then you only want to raise, the trick that I do is I will only raise if I can't keep up with demand. Um, for sales. I will only raise my prices then. You want to keep those prices low and then um, because what can happen is over the years you might have one year where you're selling a lot, the next year you don't sell as much and it might be tempting to say oh let me you know cut all my prices on everything but what happens is is that people will 
your collectors are looking for investment. They are looking that if you bought, if they bought a painting and they put their hard money down for say, say they put a thousand dollars down or five, you know, fifty dollars, whatever it is that they put down on your artwork, they want to know that the next year, if it was three, you know, let's say it was fifty dollars, they want to know that the same size and the same type of work of yours will be worth $50 in the future, or $75, $500, $5,000, that kind of thing. They want it to be growing. What is a fast way to kill a career, what you don't want to do is say, I'm going to have, you know, say it's this size, or say it's this little painting here. Um, you know, if I've got this little painting, and if it's um, this size, for example, I started these at $75 when I, 19 years ago, this, this size, this little uh, six by eight. And now they are, um, what are they now? 350, I think 350 for this size. But I've just slowly over the years, I've raised the price up. And, um, and so that way people who bought, say, 10 years ago, then now sometimes I'll get a thing and, oh, I got this in the gallery at, you know, this year. Well, what's it worth now, that size? So it's important. That way um, you'll make sure that your collector base will grow um, over time. And... Uh, and oh, hey, Davy, good to see you. And um, yeah, you know, Davy, it's an important topic um, that we talk about pricing because it's kind of a thing. A lot of people don't talk about pricing, and it's a super important thing for artists. And I think it doesn't have to be a taboo subject. I think that we can, you know, share about it and talk about it because, um, you know, it's 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 really important. Okay, so this. Time and material method. So let me show you an example of how to do a time and material kind of a calculation. So let's say uh, that you have um, a painting, and uh, let's say that your painting is a, um, let's say it's a 10 by 10 painting. And, and then you go in and, and you, uh, you want to sell this painting, and you're trying to decide what price. So. Um, Oh, and thank you for saying that, Erica. Thank you. So let's say you have a 10 by 10 painting. And let's say that you uh, bought the, ma the materials. So you went through and, and your paint for the project and your brushes. Let's say you had to go buy a new brush. And let's say you had some paint, but you factored in your paint and that type of thing. But let's say you had to go buy a new brush. And let's say that you had um, some paint that you um, put on and maybe your paint was $15 and maybe your canvas was, say, you know, um, $15. And, um, and, then you, um, and then you had a, a frame for it. And let's say that your frame was, you know, say, $40. So if you add all of those up, and you go in, and then you say, OK, I've got $15 in, plus $10 in, plus 15 plus 40 so that's $80. Now let's say that you made this painting and you wanted to ship it um, to a customer. And let's say that you're shipping. So this gets into the discussion of should you um, have free shipping? Uh, let's say you're selling through Etsy. Do I want to do free shipping or do I want to charge the customer for shipping? So there's this whole discussion of um, uh, with shipping. Uh, it can be very enticing. A lot of times people really love it if shipping is free because, uh, especially if it's an international shipment or even a, a domestic shipment, people will say, oh, I, you know, I want to get this, but I have no idea how much the shipping is going to cost, especially something like artwork, so I'm going to not get it because I'm worried. But if you tell them, hey, the shipping's included, <clears throat> then um, all of a sudden that that barrier is gone. So let's say that shipping for this was going to be, say, $20. So now on this painting, you have $100 in. And then what you can do is you can say, all right, uh, let me now also look at my time. So how long did it take me to create this work of art? And how much time did it take me to get it ready to ship? And then how much time did it take me to, uh, so I've got the, uh, the painting itself. Some people even factor in um, the uh, photographing of it. You have to photograph it. If you're putting it, for example, for sale, uh, how long did it take for me to photograph it and paint it? 
and then how long did it take for me to um, get it ready for uh, pack, you know, packaging it, that type of thing. And let me check the chat here. Oh, okay, and so um, Brenda, you're asking, how do we price according to the area we live in? You live in an area where the economy is low income and buying artwork is not considered a thing to do with a high price. Okay, so Brenda, what you can do then is you can take a look at your, um, the area that you want to be selling in. So maybe there's a locally high, high uh, uh, city that has um, a gallery, or if you're maybe selling like through Etsy, that type of thing, then you could go and look and see um, what they're doing there. And uh, so, and hey, Pencil, yeah, okay, and good to see you, Pencil. And I think I, I, think I saw you earlier in there. Okay, and so uh, Erica says what she does with Etsy, after having uh, done tons of research about what's best, you add your shipping into the cost to the product, and you say free shipping. Yeah, and I would recommend that too, Erica. That really, I think it takes the barrier away for people. Oh, Angie. Oh, my good friend Angela Rara is here. Angie, good to see you. Good to see you. So, Erica, you say you read there's a lot of... Uh, um, there's lots of a chance of Etsy ranking your products if the cost of shipping is high. Yeah, and because Erica lives in, I've, it's Monterey, right? It's Monterey, Mexico, I believe Erica lives in. So she does a lot of international shipping if she's shipping to the States and such. Okay, and Alcyon, hey, good to see you, my friend. Okay, and so uh, Erica says you have to pay a DHL, UPS, because the Mexican post is unreliable. Yeah, and so that's the key to is, um, you're, okay, so you're two hours from the U.S. border, and, um, and so the shipping is going to be, so the shipping might be um, $20, and then you have to decide also, based on the, the, um, your artwork when you go to ship, um, you'll need to determine if you want to add additional insurance onto the shipping. So oftentimes with like UPS, I work with uh, my local UPS store, and um, what they will do is I use special art crates with my work because almost everything, not almost everything, probably two thirds of what I do has to be shipped um, to, out to the galleries. The rest of the galleries are close enough, close by that I can drive things directly, but all the other stuff I have to put in these really heavy duty um, shipping and we can have a whole um, live stream just on the topic of shipping because there are a lot of intricacies with that and um, you know whether or not to insure, that kind of thing. But um, typically, you'll want to also add shipping insurance, that kind of thing. So now your time, on the, this is the time and materials method. With that time and materials method, um, so let's put this on here, too. You want to factor in shipping or consider shipping. So that's a do. And uh, do consider free shipping. So what you can do with the shipping, if you want to do free shipping, is you can kind of get an average cost of what it's going to cost to ship. And you can actually call your UPS or your FedEx. You can name a city that you would ship to and a dimension of the package, and then um, and the value of what it is and give a city address, they will actually tell you how much it will cost to ship from your um, local local place. So um, if you do that, uh, that's a kind of a neat way to do. So let me check the chat here. Okay, so um, uh, these are, okay, so um, I'll share, and so you're asking, are these my uh, prices or the usual default ones? So I'm just giving an example here of a time and materials thing. I will, I have my um, personal price list, and I'll go through that um, uh, later and, and show you how I, how I specifically do mine personally. Um, we're just going through some examples of if someone, for example, did a, a, like a 10 by 10 painting, how much they might have, and everybody's is going to be totally individual. I mean, you might buy a $2 brush, or you might have a, you know, $50 brush, or you may not have bought a brush at all. Or your paint, um, you know, your paint might be 50 cents, or it could be 30 dollars, or whatever. So, just kind of an idea of how to factor the different things in, and then for time, you want to consider these different times. Hope does hopefully that answers Alshan. Um, okay, and so and uh, Erica, you're saying one tip for people shipping their artwork if you're thinking of adding insurance, 
Make sure you read everything over. Absolutely. I've had to do a few insurance claims and was disappointed um, with that, with shipping. And yeah, they are happy to take the money. <laughs> That's true. That is true. What I tend to do is I do mine in a super sturdy container and then I don't add the insurance uh, because I know that the container is going to make it. So what you do with time and materials is you would take your materials. So these would be your materials. Say that it was a let's say for example for this example it's a hundred dollars, and then your time. So let's say it took you to do the painting and to make everything. Let's say that you had say ten hours into that painting, uh, plus the packaging, the photographing, that type of thing. So what you would do is you would take your material, which would be a hundred dollars in this example, plus your hourly rate. And so uh, some people will use um, an hourly rate of $20 an hour, some will use $25 an hour, some use um, $10 an hour, $5 an hour, some use you know 50, it just depends what you want to put for your rate. And then you would, let's say you, you used, just for example, $20 an hour then uh, 10 times 20 is 200. So you would say your materials plus your labor would be 100 plus 200 would be $300. So $300 is what you would charge um, for this painting. Now, if you are selling it, for example, in a gallery, that's gonna be your, what's called your retail price. So if the gallery takes 50%, when you get a check when the painting sells, you're going to get a check for $150. So what you want to look at then is you want to think, okay, now let me think about this because I spent $100 in materials, so your profit would be $150 minus the cost of your materials, which is in this case $100, so your profit would be $50. So the gallery is going to have $150. You're going to get a check for $150. Your profit would be $150 minus $100, which would be $50. So the way then to um, factor that would be, so, okay, oh, and pencil. Okay, hugs to you, and, um, and I hope that this is um, a helpful topic also. Yes, okay, and so let me check the chat here. Okay, so um, okay, so Diana, you said that um, Etsy shipping international is so expensive. You decided not to go international, and um, and so you know what? Yeah, I hear you on that, and that's a, a choice. I have um, I the galleries that work with my art, they do international shipping um, for me, especially like the Santa Fe Gallery, uh, Canyon Road Contemporary. But a lot of the other galleries really just do either domestic or the person picks it up locally. So yeah, that whole topic of international shipping is, is tricky. And uh, you know, oh, and hey Jonesy, good to see you. And I appreciate you guys, I appreciate all of your likes and I appreciate your, um, that you guys are here and your subscription. Um, so, so when you look at your profit then, so here this would be your profit in this case would be $50. So again, if you had a 10, let's say just in this example, your materials were $100, you decide to charge $20 an hour for your labor and you maybe spent 10 hours total on painting, photographing and packaging. And then, so your materials plus your labor was $300. And then when it sold through a gallery, it was 150. Your profit would then be $50. Now let's say that instead you sold it through uh, PayPal uh, directly through PayPal. Well, then it would be your profit would be $150 minus the PayPal commission, which is around I think three or four percent, something like that. So if we look at 150 times, if it's three percent, uh, then you would make your profit would be $145.50. So um, then, it, I'm sorry, your profit. Well, your profit actually would be your materials minus your cost. Your profit, so then your profit is actually going to be now take off um, the cost of materials. So your materials were, um, I'm sorry, not 150. <laughs> it's going to be 300 minus 
the cost. Sorry, okay, so if your, if your painting was $300, you sold it through, say, PayPal, PayPal will take, say, 3% of 300, not 150, ignore that last bit. So let's say that they took that, so we'll go 300 times 0.97, and your profit is going to be 291, or your you, what you, the check would be that you get is 291 dollars. Now, if you take off your materials, your profit would be, then be um, 291 minus 100, which is 191 dollars instead of 50 dollars. So, where you're selling your work. Um, makes a difference, but then you're also with that, you'd have shipping and that kind of thing. So these are just all kinds of considerations, but it's important to do some scenarios and think about your, um, all the different considerations when you're doing this. And uh, Oh, and I see that we have Paint with Jay. Hey, Paint with Jay, good to see you in Art Life. And um, yeah, Jonesy, that is true, yes, 50%. Uh, is a standard commission. Um, some once in a while, you run across a gallery that will try and charge 55 or 60 percent. That's kind of unusual. I try and avoid those type of galleries. Um, I do have one gallery that char that does um, 40 percent, but all the other ones that I work with are all they take 50 percent. Um, so, so then Diana, you're asking. Um, well, it's better profit by not going with a gallery. However. Um, uh, at certain price points, um, like for example, I know that I would not have been able to sell the amount of work that I've been able to sell by just doing it myself. And so the gallery, they have beautiful lighting, they have clientele, and there's some, some people will only buy through galleries, some people will only buy directly through an artist. Um, there, there are all kinds of, for every artist that's out there, um, uh, some some artists are too shy and they're like, oh, I you know I'm afraid to talk to customers, that type of thing. So it just really depends on you as an individual, what you like to do, what works for you, that kind of thing. Um, okay, so so we've talked about the similar artist model, and then um, and then I'll say, okay, let's see what Erica's saying here. Okay. Oh, Angie, you need coffee. So many numbers. Well, you know, and the thing too is Angie is um, is like once you go through a few of the numbers, it, it makes more sense. But um, and so art, like you say, you're currently taking a break from drawing. Tomorrow's realistic drawing. Oh, I'm excited to see what you're gonna do, art life. I know that you're also doing the Green Gold Challenge, and for um, for those of you who aren't already um, committed to doing the Green Gold Challenge, I hope that you'll do it. I'm so excited. Um, I've got a little two-minute video out on my channel, but um, everybody, and this kind of this color here is actually a green gold. We've got some green gold in watercolor um, on here and on here, but um, just going to go and see everybody's version of, um, of using the color green gold. It's a challenging color to use. Of course, you can have other colors in your artwork, and you upload a video to your own channel on... Uh, Sunday, or sorry, yeah, no, Saturday, Saturday, May 5th, and then put the words Green Gold Challenge or hashtag Green Gold Challenge in your title, and then I will go out and do a search for um, all of the videos that have the word Green Gold Challenge in their title or hashtag Green Gold Challenge, and then make a giant playlist. So it'll be a great way to meet other YouTubers, and it'll be a lot of fun to see. Um, all the different ways that we can use green gold. And we have over 40 people who are, who are um, saying that they're, or personally told me that they're gonna be um, doing the challenge. So it'll be a lot of fun. I modeled that after Eve Harvey Art's um, Doodle Day, which was a lot of fun. And uh, okay, so now, um, yeah, and Angie, it is. So, um, okay, and Jonesy, you're saying that, um, Okay, I'll read up a little bit here. Okay, so Erica, you're saying galleries already have audience built in and marketing is hard. And yeah, marketing is a super expensive thing to do. That's why it's nice if you have a gallery, they'll take care of that. And then Erica, you're saying anyone um, looking to sell artwork online, it, it takes an audience, it takes a while to do it. It absolutely does. And um, so paint with Jay, yeah, and so there are always ways that what's so nice is with the internet, there are a lot of things out there, a lot of different ways that we can reach an audience. 
Um, but building up your social media is super key um, for art. And that's again because, and I'll go back to, um, back to this discussion here, that with an, um, as an artist, um, what is the most important thing, and actually that's kind of a thing here too, is um, do consider your reputation, your social media. So you guys being on social media right now, what you're doing now is you're helping uh, your art career um, by being on YouTube and actively participating um, in um, you know, the live streams, that type of thing, uploading um, videos to your own channel, doing Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is that works for you. Um, those are things and methods and ways um, that you'll get recognition um, for your art because social media is so key. If you think about it, like think about Coca-Cola, Pepsi, um, McDonald's, names that are well known everywhere. Did you ever notice that they're always still advertising? They're always still marketing? And you'd be like, well, gosh, everybody thinks of that. But you want to be on people's minds as an artist. You want to be active in your art community, um, active online, that type of thing. Because um, art is not necessarily, just like musicians, um, the best musicians, if you go and hear a musician, on the, a singer on the radio, and then you go to your, to your church and you hear another person singing and it's like, oh my gosh, I think that person at church actually has more talent than the person on the radio. But maybe the person at church, um, maybe they, you know, they didn't have the same marketing opportunities and that kind of thing. So what ends up happening is it's that same way with painting, um, with any kind of artwork, sculpture, whatever it is that you do. Um, if you are connecting somehow with some someone and then they want to add your art in, um, in, in their environment, whether it's a corporation or it's an individual, um, what happens is when you are connecting with them, then, then they're bringing your work in and it's not necessarily who's the most talented because the world is out there. If you look at some famous artists, it's like, oh, you know, so-and-so has more talent than them, but it's really about... Um, it's really about that connection that they made. So let me check the chat here. Um, okay, so I'm gonna be making a playlist. Yes, Diana, so everybody who participates in the Green Gold Challenge will be out there, absolutely. And um, yeah, and Erica, you know, it's interesting about the proportion of art making time versus marketing. Um, I've heard some gallery owners say that they recommend that artists spend 60 to 70 percent of their time marketing their art and 30 to 40 percent um, actually making it and uh, for some people it's even a, a bigger proportion and that you know that is very very important it's an important thing okay so so to these pricing models and also if you guys have questions and if i've missed your question i apologize i will be going back and uh, or if i if i haven't been able to say hello to you um, I will be going back in the upload and I'll, I'll uh, be reading all of your comments and your questions. So if there's another question I didn't get, please later in the upload, write it down and I will answer that for everybody who might have that same question. Okay, so this, this third method um, of doing uh, your pricing is called the linear inch method. Okay, so the linear inch method. So what you do with the linear inch method is, um, is you go and you say, I'm gonna take my, um, so let's say that I had a, let's say that this is 12 by 10. I'm gonna take my, and this is A and this is B. So you're gonna take A plus B, and then you're gonna do it times a, a rate and then that is gonna be your price. So, um, so, so you don't go A plus A plus B plus B, you just go A plus B. So let's look at an example, let's make a, a chart for that, what that would look like. And I'll actually do, let's actually do this with some, some common sizes that people might use and I'll show you how to do, um, you know how to do this. All right, so let's make a little chart. And 
and let's say we have, um, okay, so here's our size. Actually, you know what, let's do, let's do it bigger so it's more legible here. We'll do it this way. So this is gonna, this is called the, um, the linear inch model. And a lot of artists use the linear inch model. And so what that would be is, again, you have A plus B and then times a rate. So, uh, so let's, let's just take a common size here. So let's see, let's make, um, oh, let's make like six different sizes. So let's say you had, let's say you have an eight by 10 and let's say you have 11 by 14, uh, 16 by 20, 18 by 24, 30 by 40, and then we'll go really big. Let's say you had a 60 by 40. And let's go in and let's say, um, so if you, uh, if you add eight by 10, add the two together, so that's your, so you have an A and you have a B. So your A would be eight and your B would be 10. So eight plus 10 is, um, is of course 80, or 80, I'm sorry, eight plus 10 is 18. And then this is uh, 25, so I'm just taking these two together. 16 plus 20 is 36. 18 plus 24 is 42. 30 plus 40 is 70. And 60 plus 40 is 100. Okay, and let me just check the chat here and see what we've got here. Um, oh, hey, Violet Con Connie, good to see you all the way in, in, uh, in Australia. Good to see you. Okay, and so um, let's see here if there was anything. Okay, and you guys are just saying hello to each other. Okay, wonderful. All right, so let's say that on the linear inch, so what you do is this is your number of inches then for these different sizes of artworks. And then here is where you have your rate. So what they recommend is that um, a beginner might do something like $5 per linear, per linear inch. And an established artist might use something like, say, $20 a linear inch. So, uh, so let's work out what that would be. So let's do a, let's say that this is gonna be the, so for $1, here's $1 then, um, I'm sorry, $1, $5. For $5, so we would take 18 times five. So this would be what they rec might recommend as just a starting point or a, or a, this is just kind of an industry standard. Um, might be, so five times 18 would be, for example, $90. So you would charge $90 for an eight by 10. And let's say if, it's, if you're using a, a linear rate of $5 per linear inch, then if it was five times 25, you, then you would go $125 for 11 by 14s. Your, um, you would have $180 for 16 by 20s. Your $42, um, this would be, let's see here, 216 a 30 by 40, so 70 times five, this is gonna be a $350 painting. And then a really large one, 60 by 40, is gonna be five times 100 or $500. Now, um, when you're using the linear inch model, uh, this is sometimes a lot of people use this, and then let's say that you were doing, um, say, an what they call an established artist rate, which would be maybe $20 per linear inch. So then the eight by 10 is instead gonna be $360. 11 by 14, uh, you're gonna charge retail 500. 16 by 20, you would do 720. 18 by 24, you would charge $840. A 30 by 40, you would charge $1,400. 
and a 60 by 40, you would charge $2,000. Now, and what you can also do then is you can put in your own, I encourage you to make a chart of all your prices and then you can put in whatever rate you want to charge. So um, now a challenge with this can be what if you, for example, let's say that you choose to go with $5 a linear, a linear inch. Um, and let's say, for example, you make an 8x10 and you're going to charge $90 for it. Well, what happens if, you're, if you sell it through a gallery and you get half, it's, you're going to get a check for $45. Or you maybe do it through Etsy and after shipping you maybe have $60. But let's say it costs you $75 in materials to make it, then you're actually losing money. So what can also be helpful is if you go back and you think about at the end, work backwards and say, how much profit do I want to make from each item and then go from there. Okay, so let me check the chat here. Okay, so um, Alshan, you're saying, um, yeah, Alshan, absolutely. This stream will be uploaded afterwards and um, I encourage if anybody has questions, um, I would love to hear from you with any questions later also in the upload and um, you guys feel free to uh, answer any questions that, or if you have questions that, that you can answer for somebody else, feel free to, to jump in on that. I would appreciate that. And um, yeah, okay, so this pricing system, Davey, is a fantastic pricing system. In fact, I use, um, I use a hybrid between the linear, uh, the square inch, which we'll talk about next, and, um, uh, and, and the time and materials. I do a little bit of the time and materials um, method. Uh, but mostly my work is is typically using the linear inch method. When I was first beginning and I had no sales at all, zero sales, I started with a similar artist model where I went in and I looked and uh, tried to study what other artists were doing that were similar to me. Um, and I looked other local artists uh, that had a similar size, but that were just beginning like I was. And remember that everybody, everybody who, you know, everybody always has their first painting sale. Everybody starts out at zero. So, um, you know, it's, it's exciting when you make that first sale, but don't feel bad, anybody that's out there, if you haven't made a sale yet. Uh, Picasso started at zero paintings at one point. He had zero sales, and, and it's just a matter of, um, you know, getting that first one and then building upon that. So, uh, so let's go over to our do's and don'ts. Um, so we talked about um, factoring in the gallery profit, but what we want to also think about is um, is uh, is something to avoid is a don't. What we don't want to do is we don't want to adjust prices. based on what we think someone can afford. Okay, now there might be an occasion where you have like a cousin or you have a friend or something like that and, and you were gonna make a special deal uh, for them, one time only, <laughs> you know, whatever. That's that's up to you. That's a separate thing. That's I even kind of discouraged even trying to do that. What I would encourage is if somebody's got a limited budget and they can't afford what you've got, I would recommend that you sell them like a study of something, or a, um, a try not to give them your full art because what happens is people talk, and. Um, they will come back and if somebody, if you sold a, um, let's say you sold a painting like, you know, a little guy this size and you sold the painting for $5 to one person and you sold it to, uh, for $1,000 the same size to another person, uh, over time people end up talking about either the good deals or the bad deals that they got and that is a quick way to kill your reputation is to adjust prices based on, on, or, oh, I think this person's rich, I'm gonna try and, you know, charge a ton of money for them for that. You wanna avoid doing that because even those rich people will end up researching and figure out that they got fleeced for that. So part of your reputation is once you set your prices, absolutely don't adjust those based on how much you think that someone can afford. 
And in a way, it almost kind of diminishes the person who, you know, maybe the person didn't have a lot of money and then they they felt like, oh, you know, the person didn't think I could afford to pay it or didn't think that I could buy it. So instead, think about what budget they have and then try and give them some of your art. Um, there might be a sketch that you have, even just a quick something like that, that, that they could have that would be an original from you. Um, but that's just something to think about. So let me check the chat here. Okay. So, um, okay, and you guys are talking and then... Um, Oh, and people buy sketches. They do, absolutely, absolutely. That's a, a very valid thing to, uh, to sell, is a sketch. All right, so now let's talk about the next common pricing model. And that is the, um, so we've got the linear, this is the square inch method. Okay, so the square inch method, we've got the linear inch method, and the linear inch, what you do is you take one edge plus another edge. You only count A plus B. So it's A plus B times rate on the linear inch model. On the square inch model, what you're gonna do instead, let's say you had a 12 by 10, you go A times B, times a rate and that gives you your price and you might think oh well what's the difference between these two well uh, that it's actually really interesting because here you're charging for every square inch and here you're just counting the linear inch all the way around half the perimeter you just go like that and then you multiply times a rate so the square inch method let me show you what that looks like Okay, so let's in fact do the same sizes and then we can compare linear inch versus square inch. So here's our square inch model. And let me switch pens here. So what that looks like is that looks like if you have A and B, so it's A times B times a rate. And um, let's get our sizes going here. So let and again, these sizes are, you're going to have your own sizes that you like to work in. You might call them like an A5 size or, you know, something like that. But just whatever you normally like to create art in. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So we have, uh, let's get a size. So we're going to do the same size, and I want to show you the difference in how the prices come out between the linear inch model and the square inch model. And, uh, okay, oh, Lucy. Hi, Lucy, and thank you for joining. Okay, and Erica, you have an idea could be to create studies prior to the larger painting, which should be done anyway, and offer those at lower. Yeah, absolutely. Sketches, you can do sketches at a completely different price point, and that's excellent, Erica. Yes. I had a gallery owner, um, Stan Wiederspan, told me that once. He said, keep all of your uh, preparatory studies, that type of thing, because those all can be sold at, um, you know, at a different rate than your standard work. Okay, so... Now what you do here, uh, there is a beginner recommendation for, uh, beginner recommendation is $1 per square inch. And uh, established person would be $3 per square inch. So let's go through and I'll show you these, how these numbers come out. So here, for example, um, now instead, with the linear inch, we go 8 plus 10 equals 18. Here we go 8 times 10. So this is going to be 80. So we're going to be multiplying by 80, not multiplying by 18. So you can see that it all of a sudden the, um, the numbers are different. So we've got 80 inches here. 11 by 14 is 154. 16 by 20 is 320. 18 by 24 is 452, 30 by 40 is 1,200, 
and 60 by 40 is 2400. Now, if you are doing, let's say that your rate, let's say it's $1, then, then we'll do a $3 one here. So let's do a $3 one will be here. And then, and then this column can be, you know, whatever you want to make your own personal rate. So, uh, so in this case, these are literally time, uh, 80 times 1 is 80. So all of these are 80 times uh, 154. So we take, um, so this is A times B. This is A plus B. So in this case, the square inch model, I would take an 8 by 10 is 80. 8 times 10 is 80, or is 80. And then times $1 is $80. 11 by 14 is 154 square inches. So I just go 11 by 14 is 154, and I multiply by 1, so that's $154 is what I would charge. In this case, I would charge 16 by 20 times 1 is $320. This is $452 is what the painting would cost, or the work of art, whatever it is. Could be colored pencil, could be sculpture, um, you know, anything. $1,200. And here it's $2,400. So uh, look at, and w uh, let me fill in for the what they call the established artist here. So here we have, um, now if we multiply by 3, so now we would take 8 times 10 times 3. So 8 times 10 times 3 is going to be uh, $240. In this case, 11 by 14, which is 154 times 3, is $462. And typically, uh, you round up. In galleries, you typically round up to the nearest. You know, you might run either round up or round down. 460 or call it uh, 475 or 500. Um, uh, 320 times 3 is 960. 452 dollars um, uh, times 3 that is going to be 1,296. 1,200. So the 30 by 40 size painting, um, it's 1,200 square inches times 3 dollars per square inch is going to be 3,600 dollars. And then here a 60 by 40. $2,400 times 3. So we have 60 inches times 40 inches, multiplying times $3 an hour, or $3, $3 a square inch for an established artist, which would be $7,200. So, um, and let me just check the chat here. Okay. Oh, and it was good to see you, Jonesy. Take care, Jonesy. And then, um, oh, and I, I'm, I'm uh, what I want to show here is the striking difference between these two models. So if you look at the linear inch model, let's compare sizes. So for a beginner artist, what they would recommend is the $5 per linear inch. That's kind of the industry standard. And uh, for the square inch model, beginner artist, $1 square inch. So if you look at an 8 by 10, um, in both cases, um, so they would charge $90 on the linear and you would charge $80 for the square inch model. But look, when you go 11 by 14, it goes up a little bit to a 125, but look at the jump. From 80, you go to 154. If you look at that 60 by 40, if you're making a really, really large painting, um, you're only going to charge $500, but look, if you're doing it uh, as a beginner, using the square inch model in one one model pricing model you're using five you're, you're only you're charging only five hundred dollars and then here you're charging two thousand four hundred dollars so um, what is interesting so let's in fact just get them side by side look at uh, whoops we'll get just a clean pace here so if I just uh, show the rates here so here are the 8 by 10s So look at that here. 
For a 30 by 40, if you use the square inch method, you're gonna charge 1,200, but if you're using the linear rate, you're only charging, as a beginner, $350. So, um, talking about the pros and the cons of uh, the different pricing models, and, um, oh, and I see that Lady has joined. Buenos dias, oh. And yes, I know that you do not speak English, but Lady, we're glad to have you here, and I appreciate that you're here. And everybody say hola to uh, Lady. She does these wonderful acrylic pours. So, um, so when we think about these models, I now what I'll do is I'll show you, um, let's just do a couple more of these um, do's and don'ts. Uh, commissions. So let's talk about commissions with pricing. So you do charge more for commissions. Commissions are stressful <laughs> because you're trying to make something specifically for someone rather than just making something organically the way it, it flows from you as an artist. I tend to charge, not tend to, I do charge 40% more. So I get whatever price I have for that size and then I will charge 40% more for a commission. Um, it's it's a, uh, because otherwise people can just go and um, get what you already have that you already make, but you definitely want to recognize that that work has been custom made for that individual. You might be making, um, you know, certain colors, certain things that are out of your normal comfort zone. Even if you say, I'm gonna do everything that's in my normal style, there's still that pressure of, are they gonna like it or not? So that's definitely a thing uh, to think about and to consider is, is this idea of um, charging more uh, when we do a commission. And then, um, and then we talked about uh, talking about free shipping. That's always a good idea if you can, the way you can do that is on shipping, you can go in and figure an average for where you think your customers might be. Let's say that you had one price, it would cost $20 to ship, another one it's gonna cost $40 to ship, and another one it might cost $25 to ship. Um, different cities that you might anticipate shipping to. You can set your free shipping price, you might wanna set it as an average, or maybe the most expensive, and that would cover literally everybody who's shipping, and then that way you can, um, you can do free shipping, and, um, and then it's kind of an easy way. You, you can just have your price list ready to go, and then it's like, oh, shipping is included. Add that into your price after you do your calculation. Same thing with framing. So do consider having standard frames or uh, shrink wrap or acetate, actually not shrink wrap, acetate plus a mat as far as your uh, standard sizes. So when you're working, consider making things that are gonna go into a standard size mat that you can buy. Like Blick has these really nice roadshow acetate things. They have a foam core, an acetate, and a mat. You can slip it right in there. That's something that's nice to send the customer. The artwork is protected. They're uh, rather inexpensive, but fact, be sure to factor that into your pricing. Add that on at the end. Um, uh, when you're figuring your price, if you're thinking about, for example, time and materials method. Um, and then standard frames might be that you have, um, you're working in your art. If you're gonna be framing, um, think about um, having a certain kind of frame that you always would get, and then add that into the price. Remember that if you're selling through a gallery, the gallery is gonna to wanna to take, not going to wanna take, the gallery will take uh, their rate from that. So be sure that you will make the profit that you want afterwards if you're going to be doing that, say, for example, through, um, you know, through a, through a gallery. If you're doing through Etsy, something like that, uh, um, uh, selling on uh, eBay, uh, selling uh, locally, you might have a booth fee if you do, for example, an outdoor booth, that kind of a thing, or indoor um, art festival. Uh, there might be a booth fee. So be sure to factor those things all in uh, when you're doing your pricing. Now, um, let me show you a little bit of what I did. So, uh, so in my career, um, I began with a similar artist model. 
Then uh, what I've done over time, so once you have your uh, prices set, again, uh, you want to be sure to, to um, always keep those prices consistent and then don't raise and lower the price. Um, I always do a thing where I will never lower the price. I do a thing that I've, I'm calling lifetime pricing uh, where I will only either keep the price where it is for that size of artwork or the price will go up. And then that way collectors know that they have a safety when they or uh, when they get something one year, if they buy a painting, you know, five years later, um, the painting that they bought before will be either the same price or it will now be higher in value. So let me get out and I'll show you. Um, so this is my, um, okay, and so um, Diana, you're asking, Okay, doesn't a gallery dictate your prices? Um, no, Diana, absolutely not. They will, um, they, uh, a gallery does not have any say in your price. They will um, ask you what your prices are. And so that's why when you go and you wanna uh, select a gallery, you wanna be sure to select a gallery that matches in your current price point. And if you're on the lower end of the gallery, then you have growth, so as over time, if you raise your prices. Um, that's another thing on uh, do's and don'ts. So um, you don't wanna raise your price too quickly. And then also consider, so you could consider periodic price increases. And the way that I personally do that is I, as I will actually wait until um, I will wait to raise my price until I can't keep up with demand. When you run out, or you're close to running out of art, or um, or art of a certain type. So it may be that you're doing, you know, you have a bunch of art that's maybe like, say, this size, and then maybe all of the art that's, you know, smaller, you know, maybe this size is all sold out and that type of thing. Um, you know, it, it's a matter of making sure that you don't raise the prices too high, too quickly. Um, I've been in galleries for 19 years and over time, so um, so like this little guy that's painting this size would be $75 is how I charged uh, earlier. And then now with my current price list, um, this is a, uh, this little guy here, this is a uh, six by eight, I believe. Yeah, six by eight um, is now $425. And then with a frame, it's 485. So I've made myself a price. This is my own personal, and I'm kind of going out on a limb here to show you my personal list. But um, this is personally what I charge uh, for artwork. So I have everything from a little four by six um, that is $340, and then my most expensive, uh, for example, a, a 60 by 90 is going to be. $24,200. So I'm having a very large range of offerings. And a lot of what sells for me tends to be in this, the bigger range. But um, for example, 30 by 40. So if we compare that to like the, uh, my 30 by 40 is 3,700. So I'm charging quite a bit more than, um, than that, but I it's closer actually to the square inch model. So I'm kind of using this, I, I'm, the model that I've done over time is I intended to start with a square inch model, but then what I found was that when I did that, these smaller paintings, um, these are actually close to, oh gosh, what is that per square inch? Um, 340, let me divide, $340 divided by this is uh, 24 square inches. Okay, so these little, um, these tiny little paintings, I charge $14 a square inch, but um, these bigger ones, for example, like a 30 by 40, so those are 3,700. So those are, um, let's see, 120, those are, whoops, 3,700 divided by 1,200. Okay, so those are only $3 a square inch. So I've got on one extreme $14 a square inch, and then over here they're only $3 a square inch. So I'm using something that's actually closer to a linear inch model, 
in certain range, but then um, out here the prices are closer to the square inch model. So how this happened to me over time is, um, and everybody will have their own way that they do. This is uh, larger sizes up to 120. Um, and then um, and then I have a, a different, whole different set of prices for watercolors. So my watercolors per square inch are, you know, much, much less expensive because I'm known more for my, uh, this heavy Dalbism texture, but my watercolor prices are not at all selling at the same price as my, uh, as my oils and my acrylics. Now, there are other artists who their watercolors are going to sell for way more than their oils and their acrylics. So it doesn't mean that one is better than the other. It's just what are you more known for and what has sold over time. So, um, so like for example, a little eight by 10, um, unframed eight by 10 for me in watercolor is 225, but then it's 525 if it's oil. But again, that it doesn't mean anything. Uh, it just means, it doesn't mean that watercolor is good or bad or, or whatever. It's just, that's how I've just set my prices. And then uh, my giclés or my prints, what I've done is I um, try and set them right around a dollar per square inch. Um, for that, I do sign my giclés, and then they're in a matted frame. So anyway, but I hope that that's been helpful, and I hope that this whole discussion has been helpful, you guys. I appreciate that you guys are here, and um, if you have any other questions that you haven't mentioned in the chat, um, you know, please feel free to put those questions in the comments afterwards, and I'll do my best to get those answered. And anybody that, um, if you want to also, um, you know, chime in on, on these answers, I... I would also appreciate that. So, so let's go ahead and end the live stream. And, um, and I thank you guys for watching. And all my best to you. And have a great weekend. And take care. Bye-bye.